English Plus podcast is brought to you by Danny Balan. Don't forget to visit our website www.dannybalan.com to get the transcript of this episode, interactive exercises, and more. Welcome to a new episode from English Plus podcast. Today we have a rich program for you. I hope you find what we've prepared for you interesting and useful. We will start as usual with vocabulary booster. It will be Vocabulary Booster 7 with 20 new words to learn in context with examples and, of course, interactive activities on Quizlet and a downloadable PDF with useful and fun exercises you can use to make the new words you learn part of your permanent active vocabulary. After that, we will continue with Grammar Tip, in which we will talk about using who's where and when in adjective clauses, or what's known more as relative clauses. Our next section is Say It Right, where we will talk about common mistakes people make when they use the word invent. Then we will have Between the Lines, where we will talk about some modern idioms to use in your everyday conversations. The episode will continue with Spotlight. And today we will learn about some interesting facts about Hitler, not many of you know, and some interesting questions to pose based on what you will learn. After that, we will have Movie School, where we will learn some interesting words and phrases from Gladiator, the movie. And finally, we will wrap up the episode with Beyond Language, where we will listen to a poem called A Bullet's Life. As you can see, we have a lot to cover in this episode, so without further ado, let's get cracking. But before we start, I would like to remind you that you can find a link in the description of the episode that will take you to our website where you will find the transcript of the episode and all the useful links and downloadable material that will help you get the most benefit from this course. And now let's get to it and start with Vocabulary Booster 7. Let's start with the 20 words we will learn today. What words are we going to learn today, Ben? Well, the words for today are authorize, culprit, dawdle, dissect, expend, fatality, gullible, illicit, immerse, inflammatory, memorandum, pathetic, persevere, prevaricate, quash, relish, Reminisce, scour, tribute, and writhe. Let's start with the first word, authorize. Authorize is spelled A-U-T-H-O-R-I-Z-E. But note here that in British English, people also spell the word A-U-T-H-O-R-I-S-E with an S instead of a Z. And now for the meaning. If someone in a position of authority authorizes something, they give their official permission for it to happen. For example, we can say it would certainly be within his power to authorize a police raid like that. Here he has the power to give permission to a raid, but it's not like any power. It's official power, which makes the permission official. We use the word authorization as a noun. For example, the airline got authorization for four weekly cargo flights to Chicago. We can also say authorize somebody to do something. For example, the city council authorized staff to purchase a new computer system. We also have some interesting words that are from the same family. We have authoritarian, which is an adjective that means strictly forcing people to obey a set of rules or laws, especially ones that are wrong and unfair. We say an authoritarian government, for example. We also have the adjective authoritative, which is a positive word, not like authoritarian. An authoritative book, account, etc., is respected because the person who wrote it knows a lot about the subject and it can also mean behaving or speaking in a confident, determined way that makes people respect and obey you. And now we come to the synonyms and antonyms of authorize. Empower, permit, and allow are synonyms of authorize, and ban 
forbid, prohibit, and rule out are antonyms of authorize. And now let's move on to our next word, culprit. Culprit is spelled C-U-L-P-R-I-T. When you are talking about a crime or something wrong that has been done, you can refer to the person who did it as the culprit. For example, the culprits in the robbery have not been identified. The words offender, criminal, and felon are synonyms of culprit. All right. And now for the next word, dawdle. Dawdle is spelled D-A-W-D-L-E. If you dawdle, you spend more time than is necessary going somewhere. For example, Eleanor will be back in any moment if she doesn't dawdle. Delay, loiter, and waste time are synonyms of dawdle. And hurry, hasten, and speed up are antonyms of dawdle. And now for our next word, dissect. Dissect is spelled D-I-S-S-E-C-T. If someone dissects the body of a dead person or animal, they carefully cut it up in order to examine it scientifically. For example, we dissected a frog in biology class. And the synonyms of this meaning are dismember, cut up or cut apart, and anatomize. But that's not all. If someone dissects something such as a theory, a situation, or a piece of writing, they consider and talk about each detail of it. For example, people want to dissect his work and question his motives. And the synonyms of this meaning are the words analyze, study, and investigate. And now for our next word, expend. Expend is spelled E-X-P-E-N-D. Well, to expend something, especially energy, time, or money, means to use it or spend it. For example, children spend a lot of energy and may need more high-energy food than adults. There are some interesting words in the family of expend, such as expensive and the opposite, inexpensive, and the word expenditure, which means the total amount of money that a government organization or person spends during a particular period of time. It's kind of formal. The other word that can be used every day is expense instead of expenditure. We say, for example, you should control your expenses in a better way. We have the words utilize and consume as the synonyms of expend and the words save and hoard as the antonyms. Now for our next word, fatality. Fatality is spelled F-A-T-A-L-I-T-Y. Fatality is a death caused by an accident or by violence. For example, Drunk driving fatalities have declined more than 10% over the past 10 years. Fatality can have another deeper meaning as well, and in this case, it is used only as an uncountable noun. Fatality is the feeling or belief that human beings cannot influence or control events. It's simply that feeling we all have sometimes that we cannot control what happens to us. Two interesting meanings for the same word. Now we have the words casualty and mortality as the synonyms of fatality and the word injury as the antonym. And now for our next word, gullible. Gullible is spelled G-U-L-L-I-B-L-E. If you describe someone as gullible, you mean they are easily tricked because they are too trusting. For example... I'm so gullible I would have believed him. Unfortunately, this is considered to be a bad thing. When has trusting people become bad? I agree with you, but in the world today, you cannot be too trusting as there are a lot of people lurking around that may take advantage of that, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Well, the words trusting, innocent, or naive are the synonyms of gullible, And the words suspicious and skeptical are the antonyms. Now for our next word, illicit. Illicit is spelled I-L-L-I-C-I-T. An illicit activity or substance is not allowed by law or the social customs of a country. For example, the police released information yesterday about seizing a large shipment of illicit drugs. 
The synonyms are the words illegal, criminal, prohibited, or unauthorized, and legal, lawful, and permissible are the antonyms. Now for our next word, immerse. Immerse is spelled I-M-M-E-R-S-E. If you immerse yourself in something that you are doing, you become completely involved by it. For example, since then, I've lived alone and immersed myself in my career. The synonyms of this meaning are the words engross and involve. Well, immerse can also be used in a different context. If something is immersed in a liquid, someone puts it into the liquid so that it is completely covered. For example, if you immerse the mushrooms in water, they'll become soggy. The synonyms of this meaning are the words plunge, dip, and submerge. And now for our next word, inflammatory. Inflammatory is spelled I-N-F-L-A-M-M-A-T-O-R-Y. Inflammatory is obviously an adjective. If you accuse someone of saying or doing inflammatory things, you mean that what they say or do is likely to make people react very angrily. This adjective is used to show our disapproval. For example, we say, she described his remarks as irresponsible, inflammatory, and outrageous. Provoking, incendiary, or provocative are the synonyms of inflammatory, while calming, soothing, lulling, or quieting are the antonyms. Now for our next word, memorandum. Memorandum is spelled M-E-M-O-R-A-N-D-U-M. A memorandum is a written report that is prepared for a person or committee in order to provide them with information about a particular matter. For example, the delegation submitted a memorandum to the Commons on the blatant violations of basic human rights. Or it can be a little less formal than that. A memorandum is a short official note that is sent by one person to another within the same company or organization. But it is still a formal word, I have to say. People usually say only memo instead of the whole word memorandum. And a synonym for it that is not as formal is the word reminder. Now for our next word, pathetic. Pathetic is spelled P-A-T-H-E-T-I-C. If you describe a person or animal as pathetic, you mean that they are sad and weak or helpless, and they make you feel very sorry for them. However, pathetic can also be used to show our disapproval rather our feeling just sorry. If you describe someone or something as pathetic, you mean that they make you feel impatient or angry, often because they are weak, not very good, unsuccessful, or useless. For example, she's clever, but as a teacher, she's pathetic. The synonyms of pathetic are the words moving, distressing, pitiable, or heartrending, and the antonyms are funny or hilarious. Now for our next word, persevere. Persevere is spelled P-E-R-S-E-V-E-R-E. If you persevere with something, you keep trying to do it and do not give up, even though it is difficult. For example, she persevered in her idea despite obvious objections raised by friends. Remember that we say persevere with or persevere in something or in doing something. Now for the synonyms and antonyms, plug away, pursue, or stick to it are the synonyms of persevere and give up, despair, Throw in the towel or quit are the antonyms. Our next word is prevaricate. Prevaricate is spelled P-R-E-V-A-R-I-C-A-T-E. If you prevaricate, you avoid giving a direct answer or making a firm decision. For example, without a text to assist them, they may prevaricate too long before facing the brutal truth. Lie, stretch, the truth are the synonyms of prevaricate. The antonym is tell the truth. The next word is quash. Quash is spelled Q-U-A-S-H. 
If a court or something in authority quashes a decision or judgment, they officially reject it. For example, the appeal court has quashed the convictions of all eleven people. If someone quashes rumors, they say or do something to demonstrate that the rumors are not true. For example, Graham attempted to quash rumors of growing discontent, and to quash a rebellion. Or protest means to stop it, often in a violent way. For example, troops were displaying an obvious reluctance to get involved in quashing demonstrations. Suppress is the synonym of quash, and the words start, ignite, kindle, and encourage are the antonyms. Our next word is relish. Relish is spelled R E L I S H. If you relish something. You get a lot of enjoyment from it. For example, I relish the challenge of doing jobs that others turn down. And the synonyms here are the words enjoy, like, or prefer. If you relish the idea, thought, or prospect of something, you are looking forward to it very much. For example, Jacqueline is not relishing the prospect of another spell in prison. And the synonyms for this meaning of relish are look forward to. Fancy or long for. Our next word is reminisce. Reminisce is spelled R E M I N I S C E. If you reminisce about something from your past, you write or talk about it often with pleasure. For example, I don't like reminiscing because it makes me feel old. I will have to say that this word is considered formal. We use about with reminisce. For example, they were a group of former students reminiscing about their college days. The synonyms of reminisce are remember and recollect. And now for our next word, scour. Scour is spelled S C O U R. If you scour something, such as a place or a book, you make a thorough search of it to try to find what you're looking for. For example. Rescue crews had scoured an area of thirty square miles, and synonyms of this meaning of scour are the words search, hunt, comb, or ransack. If you scour something such as a sink, floor, or pan, you clean its surface by rubbing it hard with something rough. For example, he decided to scour the sink, and synonyms of scour in this sense are the words scrub. Clean or polish. And now for the last two words for today, we have the word tribute. Tribute is spelled T R I B U T E. A tribute is something that you say, do, or make to show your admiration and respect for someone. For example, the players wore black armbands as a tribute to their late teammate. And synonyms of this meaning are the words accolade, testimonial. Eulogy or recognition. If one thing is a tribute to another, the first is the result of the second and shows how good it is. For example, his success has been a tribute to hard work, to professionalism. And synonyms of this meaning of tribute are the words testimony of, evidence of, indication of, or proof of. And now for our last word for this week's vocabulary booster section: writhe. Writhe is spelled W R I T H E. If you writhe, your body twists and turns violently backwards and forwards, usually because you are in great pain or discomfort. For example, he was writhing in agony. And the synonyms of writhe are the words squirm, struggle, twist, or toss. So that will be all for vocabulary booster seven for this week. Don't forget to use the link in the description of this episode to see the whole transcript of this episode, and more importantly, get the links to the interactive activities and PDF downloadable activities based on the words you have just learned about in Vocabulary Booster Seven. Now, before we move on to the grammar tip section of this episode, Ben will give you a sneak peek of what's coming your way in our next episode. Just to get you excited, and because we do want you to come back for more next week. 
I guess after you hear about what we have in store for you next week, you will want to do that and learn more English with our English Plus podcast. So we will start with vocabulary booster. Vocabulary booster next week is not going to be the same like every week. We're going to teach you words you can use to describe people's appearance. For our grammar tip next week, we will talk about a little, a few, and the difference between them and little and few. In our Say It Right section, we will talk about common mistakes while using the words fun and funny. In our spotlights, we will talk about reality TV. In our movie school, we will learn some phrases and words from The Dark Knight. And finally, in Beyond Language, we will listen to a short story called Morphe's Dream. And now let's get back to Grammar Tip. We will talk now about some grammar, and today we will focus on an area related to adjective clauses, or what you might know as relative clauses. We use adjective clauses all the time. It enables us to join sentences together to avoid repetition. For example, instead of saying Sarah is an excellent student, you have just met Sarah as two sentences, we can join the two sentences together because they have something in common, which is Sarah in this case. And because the thing in common is a person, we use the relative pronoun who for this matter. Instead of saying or writing two sentences, we can say Sarah, who you have met, is an excellent student. Or, you have just met Sarah, who is an excellent student. And that is one sentence. Joining two sentences when we can is much better because this makes our style stronger and we avoid repetition at the same time. However, today we are not going to talk about relative clauses in general. We are going to focus on using whose, where, and when in adjective clauses. But before we do that, let's quickly remind you of the other adjective clause pronouns. When the thing in common between the two sentences is a person, we use who, as we did in the example I gave you earlier about Sarah. But when the thing in common is a thing, the adjective clause pronoun is which instead of who. We can also use that for people or things, but it cannot be used in all cases, so you have to be careful. Maybe we will talk about that in another episode. Now let's focus on whose, when, and where. If the thing in common is not a person or thing, but a person or thing and a possession that belongs to that person or thing, we use whose. Let me explain that better in an example. Let's say that the two sentences we have are, I know the man, his bicycle was stolen. The thing in common between these two sentences is not the man himself, but the man and his bicycle. So, it is a man and a possession of his. And in this case, we use whose that is used to show possession. Whose carries the same meaning as other possessive pronouns used as adjectives such as his, her, its, and their. And like his, her, its, and their, whose is connected to a noun. In our example, instead of saying his bicycle, we say whose bicycle. I'll go back to the two sentences. I know the man. His bicycle was stolen. To join these two sentences together, I will get rid of his and use whose instead. So the one sentence becomes, I know the man whose bicycle was stolen. Much better, no? Shorter and stronger. Sometimes the order is a little more complicated because his, her, its, or their are not at the beginning of the second sentence. So we have to be flexible. Let me illustrate that in a different example. The two sentences we would like to join are, The student writes well. I read her composition. You see, here the common thing between the two sentences is the student and her composition. The problem is that the student does not come at the end of the first sentence like the first example Danny talked about. So we have to insert the adjective clause in the middle of the first sentence. And the second sentence doesn't start with a possessive adjective, so we have to change the order of that as well. It might sound a little complicated, but it is not. The first sentence we have is, the student writes well. So, according to what Ben just said, 
we will insert the adjective clause after the student and before rights. Very well. Let's start with just that. The student whose, and we continue with writes well. Now I have to work with the second sentence. After whose, I have to mention what the possession is, just as if I were using the possessive adjective her. In our example, the possession is the word composition. So let's add this to our sentence. The student whose composition, and we finish with writes well. Now let's add what's left of the second sentence to complete our sentence. We have the phrase I read left. Now to put it all together, the student whose composition I read writes well. It's not that difficult, is it? Well, much of grammar understanding depends on breaking sentences apart and putting them back together to understand how grammatical structures are formed. That's right. Now, if the thing in common is a place, we can use where to join the two sentences together. The two sentences we have are the building is very old, he lives there, meaning in that building. The thing we have in common is the building and there. So we can join the two sentences together and to do that we can use where because the relation has to do with place. So the joint sentence becomes the building where he lives is very old. We did the same in splitting the first sentence because we should use the adjective clause just after the thing in common in the first sentence. Some of you might say that, yes, the thing in common between these two sentences is a place, but it is a thing too. So can't we use which instead of where? And the answer to that is yes. However, if we use which, we will have to use the preposition of place that we did not use with where, since where refers to place and we don't have to bring another reference to place in the sentence. So, if you want to do the same using which, you can say, the building in which he lives is very old, or the building which he lives in is very old. Well, in this case as well, you can use that if you like and say the building that he lives in is very old. Or because the building is the object of the second sentence, you can omit the adjective close pronoun altogether and say the building he lives in is very old. That's interesting. So, as you can see, never look at grammar as shackles that deter your progress in English, but as many different keys that open the same door. You are learning different ways to say or write the same thing, which can prove useful if you happen to forget one of these ways or simply to add variety and richness to your speaking and writing. That's right. And now let's move to when, which is used when the thing in common between the two sentences has to do with time. Let's listen to these two sentences we have. I'll never forget the day I met you then, which means on that day. So. As you can see, the thing in common is the day, which is a time. So, we can use when to link these two sentences together. We can say, I'll never forget the day when I met you. And because time is also a thing, we can use which or that instead of when. We can say, I'll never forget the day on which I met you, or I'll never forget the day that I met you. And again, because the day in the second sentence is in the place of an object, we can join the two sentences together without using any adjective clause pronouns. We can say, I'll never forget the day I met you. I hope you found grammar tip for this episode interesting and useful. And now we will move on to our next section, Say It Right. And today, we will talk about the common mistakes people usually make when they use the word invent. So, without further ado, let's get to it. I'll start with a sentence that includes an incorrect use of invent, and Ben will explain how to fix the sentence. The sentence is, It will not be long before scientists invent a cure for this terrible disease. Many people confuse the word invent with discover. Invent means to create a machine, instrument, system, or process which has never existed before. Like when we say, who invented the telephone? Or, the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney in 1793. On the other hand, discover is to find or find out something for the first time. For example, 
penicillin was discovered almost by accident. So here, instead of saying, it will not be long before scientists invent a cure for this terrible disease, we should say, it will not be long before scientists discover a cure for this terrible disease. Now for the next sentence. I'm sure that your host families will invent lots of interesting things for you to do. Here, what we really mean to say is to think of or to think up. Think of means to produce a plan, idea, or suggestion by thinking. For example, can you think of a good birthday present for David? Think up means to produce a completely new plan, idea, or suggestion by thinking hard about something. So, in our case, this is the meaning we want, not invent. So, instead of saying, I'm sure that your host families will invent lots of interesting things for you to do, we should say, I'm sure that your host families will think up or think of lots of interesting things for you to do. Now for the third and last sentence in this section. The word workaholic was invented in America. If you think about it, you might find nothing wrong with it, but there is a word for this specific use, especially when we join two words to make one. And this word is coin, not invent. So instead of saying the word workaholic was invented in America, we should say the word workaholic was coined in America. That's right. And now that we have pointed out the common mistakes using the verb invent and how to fix them, we can move on to between the lines. We will learn some common modern idioms in between the lines today. I will give you the examples with the idioms in them and Ben is going to explain what these idioms mean. Shall we, Ben? Yep. Let's get to it. So, our first sentence is, This program looks at one couple's experience of living next to neighbors from hell. The idiom here is from hell. People frequently refer to difficult people or unpopular things as being the things or people from hell. For example, the neighbors from hell or the airport from hell. But I have to say that neighbors from hell is the most common use for this idiom. I hope you don't have neighbors from hell as there aren't many things you can do about it. Now for our next sentence. That young politician was in the news every day for weeks, but now he seems to have fallen off the radar. The idiom we have here is fall off the radar. To fall off the radar simply means to be forgotten. Our next sentence is, Sophia is a wonderful nurse. She'll always go the extra mile for her patients. The idiom here is go the extra mile. To go the extra mile is to make an extra big effort or do things that are more than strictly necessary. That's right. Sometimes we all need to go the extra mile in order to achieve anything big in our lives. Now for our next idiom. The website www.cheapholidays.org does exactly what it says on the tin. The idiom is do exactly what it says on the tin. This idiom is a British English idiom that means to do exactly what it claims to do or what is expected of it to do. And that's it. Our next idiom is I'm cool with that. What does it mean when someone suggests something and you say to him or her, I'm cool with that? Well, that simply means I'm happy with the suggestion. All right. Now for another idiom. It doesn't float my boat. What does that mean? Well, that's kind of the opposite of I'm cool with that. Float someone's boat means to seem exciting, attractive, or interesting to someone. So in this sentence, it doesn't float my boat. It means I don't agree with what you like or are interested in. I have one more sentence for you. I'm fed up with him big time. Or he's into judo big time. What does big time mean? Well, we hear people say that all the time and it simply means extremely. So that was all about our idioms for today. Well, I would like to add a couple more idioms to this list since we're talking about modern idioms. Yeah, please, by all means. I think we should also mention end of story, too much information and don't even go there. Excellent examples. Well, if you do not want to discuss anything further, you can say, that's it, end of story. 
Yeah, that's right. And if you think that someone is telling you about very personal things that you do not want to hear about, you can stop them by saying too much information. Let's give them an example of when people usually use this idiom. Yeah. You remember when I got food poisoning the other day? Yeah. It's over now, isn't it? Yeah, but when I came back home, I had diarrhea. Yes, I remember. You told me about that. Yeah, but I didn't tell you that I had to use the toilet like 10 times that night and the color of my... Stop, stop, stop. Too much information. I don't think our listeners or I would want to know about that. So, this is an example of when people use the expression too much information. Sorry about the example, though. Yeah, that wasn't the best example ever, but you got the point. And now for the last idiom for today. If a friend starts talking about a subject you do not want to discuss, maybe because it is too personal, embarrassing, or even confidential, you could respond, don't even go there. So, Danny, tell us what you did after the party we had last week when you drank too much and don't even go there. See, another example of when you might want to use this idiom. That'll be all for Between the Lines for today. I hope you can put the idioms you learned today to good use and start using them in your conversations. Now we will take a short break and we'll be back. Don't go away. Do you want to learn PowerPoint in a project-based course that will take you from beginner to mastery? Do you want to supercharge your presentations and make them highly interactive? Do you want to learn tips and tricks that will take your PowerPoint skills to the next level? Do you want to make stunning presentations no one else in your workplace even knew was possible using PowerPoint while keeping them relevant enough to dazzle but not distract? Then there is the right online course for you. PowerPoint Masterclass Create Interactive Presentations is a project-based course from beginner to advanced. In the essential section, you will learn everything you need to start creating interactive presentations in PowerPoint while applying all the information you learn in a project, the instruments of the orchestra. After that, the journey will continue with 11 interactive projects that you will create step by step while following along with the course videos. Each project is embedded with concepts that are highly transferable so you can use in any of your future PowerPoint projects. Enroll now in PowerPoint Masterclass on Udemy. Use the link provided in the description to get the best available price. Make your PowerPoint presentations as interactive as they have never been before. I'll see you in the course. Welcome back to English Plus Podcast, and now we will move to Spotlights. Today we're going to talk about something you may or may not know about Adolf Hitler. We all know that Hitler is one of the most hated historical figures for the devastating destruction he brought upon the world and the gruesome massacres he ordered. But that is something you might all know about. What we will talk about today is his ninth life. Ninth life? You mean to say his regrettable ninth life? Yeah, you could say that. So... Adolf Hitler was born in Austria in 1889. With that, he had shared the fate of his siblings Gustav, Ida, Otto, and Edmund, all of whom died before the age of six. Instead, Adolf survived his childhood, two significant injuries during World War I, and at least six assassination attempts before his rise to power in 1933. An Englishman by the name of Henry Tandy may have also unwittingly assisted in the future Führer when both were soldiers fighting on opposite sides during the Battle of Marcoing in World War I. An injured Hitler is said to have passed through Tandy's line of fire. I took aim, Tandy recalled years later, but couldn't shoot a wounded man, so let him go. Although some historians cast doubt on Hitler's claim that he was among the men whom Tandy spared, The young private's humane decision to hold fire would haunt him for the rest of his life. If only I had known what he would turn out to be, said Tandy. 
When I saw all the people, women, and children he had killed and wounded, I was sorry to God I let him go. Wait a minute, is this story true? Well, no one can tell for sure if Hitler was among the men Tandy spared, although Hitler claimed to be to foster the belief that God had always protected him and so. But that doesn't matter. Assume this story is true. Would you want Tandy to kill young Hitler? Would you have killed young Hitler if you were Tandy? Well, I might say yes, because I know now who Hitler grew to become. But back then, I might have made the same humane decision just like Tandy. Would you have done that if you somehow knew for sure that this man would become a monster in the future? I can't imagine how I would have known such a thing, but yes, I guess I would have killed him in this case. But now comes the big question. Do you really believe that if you had killed Hitler before his rise to power, you would have stopped the monstrosities of World War II? Or would it have happened anyway? Would killing one man or sparing the life of another change the course of history? Or is human history like a river bound to reach the sea? And unfortunately, in our case, it is a sea of sins. Some people may answer these questions from a religious point of view. That's right, but let's not go there because that will be so controversial. Now, as usual, in Spotlight, we do not pose questions to give answers to, and we don't claim to have the answers to these questions. All these questions are just food for thought. It's good exercise for our brains. Yeah, that's right. Intentional thinking about deep and complex things does sharpen our brains. It will be much better than taking the same time to finish the next level in Candy Crush. No offense to Candy Crush people. Yeah, none taken. So that will be our spotlight for today. I hope you found the information and questions we shared with you interesting enough to think about. And now for our next section, Movie School. And our movie for today is Gladiator. I love Gladiator, and I think it was one of Russell Crowe's best roles ever. I agree. Not only because he got an Academy Award for his role that year, but I think he really connected to the character of Maximus, and he transferred the audiences there. Now, for the dialogue we picked from Gladiator, it's the dialogue between Commodus and his father, Marcus Aurelius, or Caesar. When Caesar decides to make Maximus his successor, Commodus gets mad at his father and kills him at the end of the scene. It is a very touching scene, and the music that comes along by Hans Zimmer is just brilliant. So this time, Ben and I won't be performing the dialogue because, to be honest, it's kind of impossible to perform something Joaquin Phoenix has already performed. We simply can't even come close to his level. So, we will listen to Joaquin Phoenix, who played Commodus, and Richard Harris, who played Marcus Aurelius, in this powerful dialogue, which you can find in the transcript, if you like, of course. After we listen for the first time, we will talk about some important words and phrases, and we will let you hear the dialogue again. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Commodus in his father's tent after his father sent for him to tell him about his decision to make Maximus his successor. Enjoy. Are you ready to do your duty for Rome? Yes, father. You will not be emperor. Which wiser all the man is to take my place? My paths will pass to Maximus. To hold in trust until the Senate is ready to rule once more. Rome is to be a republic again. Maximus. Yes. My decision disappoints you? You wrote to me once. Listing the four chief virtues. Wisdom, justice, fortitude, and temperance. As I read the list, I knew I had none of them. But I have other virtues, Father. Ambition. That can be a virtue when it drives us to excel. Resourcefulness. Courage, perhaps not on the battlefield, but there are many forms of courage. Devotion, 
to my family, to you. But none of my virtues won your list. Even then, it was as if you didn't want me for your son. Oh, Commodus, you go too far. I search the faces of the gods for ways to please you, to make you proud. One kind word, one full hug, where you pressed me to your chest and helped me tight. Would have been like the sum of my heart for a thousand years. What is this enemy you hate so much? All I've ever wanted was to live up to Caesar, father. Commodus? Your false as a son is my failure as a father. Such a strong scene. Yes, it is. A moving one, too. Now, let's shed some light on some of the important words and phrases in it before listening to it again armed with this knowledge. Let's do it. First, we have when Caesar said, My powers will pass to Maximus. Power can pass from one person to another. There are no new words here, but it is not always new words that we want to learn, but collocations or words that go together, like power and pass in this example. Then we have the four chief virtues. You might know wisdom and justice, but what about fortitude and temperance? Fortitude is courage shown when you are in great pain or experiencing a lot of trouble. And temperance means sensible control of the things you say and do, especially the amount of alcohol you drink. Then Commodus talked about his own virtues, at least the ones he thinks he has. And these were ambition, courage, resourcefulness, and devotion. You might know ambition and courage, but what about resourcefulness and devotion? Resourceful is the adjective from resourcefulness, and it means good at finding ways of dealing with practical problems. And devotion means the loyalty and love that you show towards a person, job, etc., especially by working hard. Commodus said, all I've ever wanted was to live up to you, Caesar. What does it mean to live up to someone? To live up to someone is to live or act in accordance with certain ideals, promises, or expectations that person might have. You live up to someone because you admire that person so much and you want to be like him or her. Or you want to please this person and make him or her proud. And before that, Caesar said to Commodus, you go too far, which means to do something too extreme. And in the end, even though Caesar blamed himself for what their relationship came to be by saying, your fault as a son is my failure as a father, that did not stop Commodus from killing his own father. Such a scene, and such a dialogue as well. And now, armed with this new knowledge, let's listen to the same dialogue again, and I bet you will enjoy it a lot more this time because you understand it now much better than the first time. So, enjoy Are you ready to do your duty for Rome? Yes, Father. 
you will not be emperor. Which wiser old man is to take my place? My powers will pass to Maximus. To hold in trust until the Senate is ready to rule once more. Rome is to be a republic again. Maximus. My decision disappoints you? You wrote to me once, listing the four chief virtues. Wisdom, justice, fortitude, and temperance. As I read the list, I knew I had none of them. But I have other virtues, Father. That can be a virtue when it drives us to excel. Resourcefulness, courage, perhaps not on the battlefield, but there are many forms of courage. Devotion to my family, to you. But none of my virtues won your list. Even then, it was as if you didn't want me for your son. Oh, Commodus. You go too far. I searched the faces of the gods for ways to please you, to make you proud. One kind word, one full hug, where you pressed me to your chest and held me tight. Would have been like the sum of my heart for a thousand years. What is this enemy you hate so much? All I've ever wanted was to live up to you. Caesar. Father. Commodus. Your false as a son is my failure as a father. I hope you've liked our movie school for today. We will move on now to Beyond Language. And as usual, I'll leave you with Ben and one of my poems from Identity Poetry Collection. The poem is called A Bullet's Life. It is a poem that tells the story of a bullet going from the factory it was made in all the way to the battlefield. All the thoughts and feelings of this single bullet until it lands in its final destination. You might find the bullet a little naive as it doesn't know the complex realities as we men do. But maybe we should all be as naive as a bullet. Who knows? I hope you like the poem and before I leave you to Ben, I would like to remind you one more time that you can find a link in the description of the episode that will take you to our website www.dannyballan.com and remember it is d-a-n-n-y-b-a-l-l-a-n.com and the link will take you to a post we made specially for this episode where you will find the full transcript of the episode and you can practice the words you have learned interactively on the website. And you can also download the worksheet we made especially for the vocabulary booster in this episode. So take the link and visit the post. And to support us, share the post with your friends to help us reach more and more people. 
Thank you very much, and I will leave you now with Ben and a bullet's life. Let's get to it and start our final section for today's episode, Beyond Language. A bullet's life. I was born yesterday in a hustle-free factory. A man was smoking carelessly on top of the gunpowder around the cases and me. Fitting me inside is never an easy task, yet it is never done manually anymore. Nor does anyone tend to save on me. I'm abundant like the sun, yet I mostly shine at night. I was loaded in a box. I looked around in shock. I thought I was unique. Thousands of brothers and sisters lining up to be loaded and wasted. For fear or joy, we're viciously shot. Legend has it, a bullet tells the truth. A bullet that knows the righteous way to go. A bullet controlling its primer. The road was long and stories were longer. None will ever see a son. How could they ever claim a father? Where do these stories come from? Wait, the truck has stopped. In the distance you hear a familiar sound, our kin being wasted again. Yet the sound alone was not enough to tell whether it was to kill or just for fun. I was in such a big company, now in a magazine. It feels too light, loaded, not with so many. Brothers in arms, are we not? For we will probably spill the same blood. Alas, in vain, like these poor soldiers, some of us are sent to die, some are sent to kill. We're all younger than those, but sometimes it feels they're younger still. Lasting for a couple of seconds shorter than memory on a battlefield, but we stay in the memory of those who mourn the ones we kill. Who's more memorable now, a soldier or a bullet? Every soldier gets one, today or in fifty years, in the head, in the heart, or in memory. Oh, there are a lot. Every successful shot that killed a friend has become a legend. Now for wrath, stand fast, brothers. Enemies are whizzing everywhere. Prepare to die, to kill and conquer. I had the best view in the house, the first sneaky shot to come out. My man was moving slowly, trying to get a vantage point. But wait, isn't that a child? I can see from the barrel. I held myself tight. Click. I stood still, withstanding the urge to fly. Too late for my pal. I gave him away. He did receive us from the other side. So many there was no one left of us for any special memory. Oh yes, those were also brothers. Like these fools, we were all the same. We stayed for the whole day in the loaded magazine, all intact except for me. I thought I was saving someone, but I killed a friend. Take me back to a factory before I harden like life. I wish I'd been molded into something else. But wait. Here comes the very boy I tried to save, salvaging and desecrating bodies. Why did you shoot, young man? My friend is already dead. Stop wasting my brothers. I had to take revenge. It was time. I jammed, and now I can simply unjam. But wait for the perfect angle. Here I go. I'm inside his little skull. It's dark in here. Am I dead? The boy's about to be. Well, let me look. For I may see a trace of cocaine, not too young to take it, now that I've been in his head. A memory flashes here and there, his family on a wall lined up and killed, like lambs no one did understand what their blood for was spilled. But that was a long time, I doubt the boy still recollects. Oh no, I saw what I came here in for at last, the reason behind my being in all. I saw the purpose in his little mind. Like all these soldiers who died in vain and all my brothers who died in shame, the boy's mind was all thinking of one thing. Like all of us, the boy was only playing a game. That was all for today's episode. All the best from English Plus Podcast, and we will see you again next week. 